Okay, hey there, welcome back everybody. So as you can see, we're back in the home office for this recording. Uh, and this is going to be a shorter uh, lecture. We're going to be talking particularly about uh, regulation of the transport industry. And like most of these lectures, this serves as a sort of vehicle, pun intended, uh, serves as a vehicle for some, some particular aspects of, of regulatory design. And in this case, uh, we're going to use the transportation industry as a sort of vehicle for discussing uh, the effects um, of regulation on complementary uh, markets as well as uh, substitute producers. So substitutes and complements. Now, before we get too far into this, it's, it, we should make a note of a couple key pieces of terminology. First is an industry. Okay, when we speak of an industry, we're speaking of a firm or several firms that produce a given type of output, like say the semiconductor industry or the automobile industry or the shipping industry. An industry can be made up of one firm, like in the case of a natural or artificial monopoly, or several firms. Okay, and the, an industry can produce within several different markets, okay? Which brings us to the second of our term. A market is where a particular good or service is exchanged. So for example, the automobile market or the market for bottled water, okay? You, you name it, right? Any of these things around me, you know? And so markets, of course, can, can receive goods from different industries. So for example, if I'm looking in the market for ground transportation, I might consider sending the good or service by truck, or I might consider sending it by rail or by train. In other words, I might utilize the trucking industry in the ground transportation network market, or I might use the railroad industry in ground shipping, market for ground shipping. Okay. So we consider those two ideas, markets and industries, and how they interrelate to each other. We start to get ideas of, of what, what we sort of need to focus on here. So first off, we should recognize that when we regulate a given industry, that regulation is effectively going to provide a subsidy to any substitute providers in other industries. I'll say that again. So if we regulate, and that regulation impose a cost, right? It's sort of, I'm assuming that what I'm saying. If we regulate a given industry and our regulation imposes costs, that effectively creates a subsidy, subsidy for any substitute industry that can provide in that market. So for example, if we regulate trucking and we drive the price of trucking up, that in the market for ground transportation, we are effectively subsidizing rail or trains. Similarly, you know, we, we might we might say, well, there also would be air 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 transport too, right? Yeah, that's right. To the degree to which we can move from say trucking or rail to air, right? If we regulate trucking, we're likely subsidizing rail and air. Conversely, okay, you get the idea. So as a consequence, we should understand that regulating one industry where there are substitute industries in a given market, it's likely to move demand patterns away from our regulated market and into the deregulated market to the extent that costs increase in one relative to the other. Additionally, we should recognize that many markets complement other markets. So for example, if I regulate, say, ground transportation, or more particularly, trucking, and if I have a town that can only be served by the trucking industry, cannot be served by rail or air transit, I should recognize that raising costs to the trucking industry are going to raise cross costs across the board in that small town. Similarly, if we have a town that's only served by rail, uh, regulating the rail industry is going to impact uh, all markets in that town. Now, this can cut both ways, it can go both ways. And is the basis, so when we understand these sort of complementarities, right, it becomes the basis for a lot of sort of social demand for regulation. 
let's say we have a small town that is only served by, let's say, trucks, right? So all transportation uh, in and out of that town, all goods and services have to go by truck. There's no rail lines there, and there's no airport anywhere nearby. The town may feel that the trucking industry is taking advantage of them. Okay? Their costs are high in their town because shipping costs are high, and they would like shipping costs to be lower. And even though perhaps we may look at it from a nationwide perspective and say, oh, well, that trucking industry is competitive nationwide, within those certain geographies, they may not feel that it's competitive and they may demand regulation of that industry. Okay. And indeed, you know, the, the history of bolt trucking, rail and air regulation, uh, that's all a big part of it. So the fact that the transportation industry as a whole sort of moves goods and services around for almost all other industries okay, makes it very important to large numbers of people. right? And that means that there are a lot of what we call vested interests or people who have an interest in the prices being a certain way. Over here we see some sort of examples of regulatory um, structures that have been used in this case in trucking and rail okay so value of service price we're gonna set the price based upon the value of the the good being transported right okay so if you're transporting gold you get to charge more than if you're transporting lead <laughs> or if you're transporting you know diamonds you get to charge more than if you're transporting um, I don't know furniture maybe equalizing discrimination Rate should not differ across shippers or size of shipment. Okay. Now, in other words, like it doesn't matter whether you're shipping, you know, a dozen eggs or uh, you know one package of, of eggs, right? Or or you know a whole a whole ton of eggs. Now these both and these are just a couple examples of this, right? Okay. Other examples are like based upon geography, like this geography shouldn't be more expensive than that geography or, or you know, there's lots of these, right? And so sort of what's the rationale for these historic uh, regulatory structures? Well, it, they're sociological, right? And they are all coming from the idea that small businesses, small communities should be able to compete and should be able to exist. So just because I live in a small town maybe doesn't mean I shouldn't be able to get my crops to the market. Even though my farm is a small farm, I should be able to get my crops to market. Just because my manufacturing business exists in a remote location doesn't mean I shouldn't be able to get my goods and services to the bigger city to compete with all the other firms on an even playing field. Okay. Um, and so this is this is sort of the basis of a of a lot of of sort of regulatory structure, right? And it has to do with what? It has to do with the complementarities that exist across different markets. So complementary markets may be negatively affected, resulting in a demand for regulation in a otherwise competitive market. So the third thing that I want to talk about in this lecture is this idea of predatory pricing and regulation designed to uh, minimize predatory pricing within, in this, we're gonna use a context of transportation again, okay? Now, in this case, we have two, this is actually from a scenario that, that's in your textbook, uh, for, for if you're taking this course, right? But what we have here is two airlines, let's call it small airline F and big airline U, okay? And small air, Big airline is operating a given route. That is, they're flying between two cities that are fairly close together, okay? And it's pretty expensive, let's say, to fly. The big airline is charging, let's say, $200 to fly between these two cities. I know you think $200, I know it's cheap, right? But let's just say $200 to fly. Big airline will charge you $200, okay? And little airline says, well, we can do it for cheaper. We can do it for $100. Okay, so they start flying back and forth for $100. Then big airline says, whoa, 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 hang on here, and drops their prices down to $100. So now the big airline will fly you for $100 too. And you might be saying, well, well, that's how competition is supposed to work, right? And, and then you might be saying, okay, well, well, hang on. 
if when the big airline starts pricing at $100, there's no longer any demand for the little airline. Everybody wants to go on the big airline. It's charging the same price as the little airline. We'll go with the, you know, the big one. We know it, whatever. And then the little airline goes out of business. And then right after the little airline goes out of business, the big airline raises the prices back up to 200 Okay. Is this an example of what we call predatory pricing? It's hard to say without knowing the facts. Now, to just remind you, what is predatory pricing? Predatory pricing can, can you have to look at the law, right, how it defines it in the particular case, right? But predatory pricing generally refers to pricing at below cost in order to drive competitors out of business, okay? So I'll say that again selling below cost in order to drive competitors out of business. Okay. So is this an example of predatory pricing? Well, it's hard to say. Let's, let's take a look at this situation as it's sort of graphed out over here. Okay, so I'm just going to use a cursor. This is the industry demand. You notice it's the same in both ones, right? This is price, this is quantity. Okay, and let us say that, you know, initially the Residual demand for the small airline, DF, is this. Okay, now what do I mean by residual demand? I mean, once the passengers buy the big airline tickets, how, many, how much demand is left over for the small airline? Um, so let's say that this one here is the residual demand when the price of the, for the big airline is 200. So this is the demand for the small airline when the price of the big airline is 200. Okay. Then I said the big airline lowers its price. Okay, so we'll notice, first of all, let's go back. So initially, right, this is the demand, the residual demand for the small airline, and this is their cost function. So you'll notice that, of course, they can profitably provide airline service. They're pricing at 100, big airlines pricing at 200 they can slide under that residual demand and earn a profit within that market. Okay. But when the big airline lowers its price to 100, the residual demand curve to our little airline is just this one here. It's this lower demand. Now, why is it lower? Because, of course, if the big airline lowers its prices, more people buy the tickets on the big airline, and there's less demand left over for the little airline. And we'll notice then that at hundred dollars for the big line the demand the residual demand is insufficient for the little airline to operate anymore okay so this upper graph is a scenario that I just laid out okay now is it predatory pricing well as economists we have to go in and figure out well were they doing something that um, were they losing money just to drive people out of business so because they, they knew that if the competition went away they could make money again right that's what we have to figure out as regulators and as economists okay okay so this is the demand curve for the industry and then we've got this demand here okay <clears throat> price at 100 so when their price is at 100 here their demand looks like this they can provide this quantity okay what does their cost structure look like it's what it's going to tell us whether it's predatory or not. If, if their cost structure is like this, then indeed they're selling at below cost, right? So they're selling those tickets at below cost. So there's some motive or some evidence of a motive to drive competition on a business. However, is their cost structure like this? Well, then it's not necessarily the case. What we have then is we have a situation where there was you know, there's the ability to lower prices and still make a profit. So there must be some sub-additivity problem, which we've discussed in an earlier lecture, that's allowing these, um, in this case, this market for this particular trip to be produced at a, at a sizable profit uh, for, the, for, the, for the existing air, airline, um, but also where it's not possible for a, another firm to come in and be sustainable over a long period of time. Okay, and so we saw why this would be. Now, given the numbers here, 200 and 100, I think that's extremely unlikely, but <laughs> um, it's illustrative of, of the situation, right? 
So we don't necessarily know, right? Prices were up, then they went down on the big loan, and they went back up right away afterwards. Was it predatory? Was it not? Well, it depends. It depends. Were they selling, you know, below cost? Uh, was there deliberate intent to drive the competitor out of business? Okay, these are things that we're going to need to find out. Okay, so I said this one was be quick, and and I meant it, right? Now, if you're taking this class, there's quite a bit more in the in-class portion of this one uh, that we're going to go through, but that's it for this video lecture. But to summarize what we learned in this one, three things, right? Markets are not industries, and industries are not markets. Okay. Industries can produce in multiple markets, and markets can draw from multiple industries where we have one market with multiple industries those industries are substitutes for each other and regulating one will impact demand for the others okay second of all industries can can produce across multiple markets and industries operating in a given market can have effects in other markets that is to say markets can complement other markets. So for example, in this case, we talk about transportation, right? The trans market for transportation can impact many, many, many other markets. And if those other markets are negatively impacted by goings on in our initial industry, in this case, transportation, then there's likely to be social calls for regulation, okay? Even, even if that market is otherwise competitive. And two, we should, you know, we should, we should expect that, right? We should expect that different things like different geographies, so what, might, what be, might be nationally competitive or even regionally competitive may not be locally competitive, right? Or at least appear to be so. And so you get, you're likely to get a lot of social demand for regulation if there's complementary markets that are being negatively impacted. Okay. And then also these regulations may take, they may seem very strange, right, from, from an economic standpoint. Then the third thing that we learned about in this is that even apparent clear-cut cases of predatory competitive activity may or may not be so, right? Just because a firm lowers a price out, eliminates competition, or raises prices up, doesn't necessarily mean that that's predatory action on the surface. Doesn't mean it's not, right? Okay, but it's something we have to investigate as to whether the firm's costs are such that they were essentially losing money just to drive everybody else out of business. Uh, because we know from previous lectures that a price can be lowered, right, and 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 they can still continue to make money in a, in a not fully competitive market, in or a not fully competitive industry for that matter. Okay. All right, that's enough for this time. See you again next time. Take care, everybody.